Have you ever wondered if animals could become mentally ill just like people? As I have told you guys many times, humans can be very chauvinistic about how they view things that affect people. Hi, I'm your favorite dysfunctional scientist, and let's talk about it. If you've spent any time around animals at all, it should be no surprise that animals experience things like fear and anxiety. It really shouldn't have taken brain scans to realize this. I mean, have you ever seen a tiger pacing in a little cage at a zoo? There's also other conditions like trauma and psychosis that animals can experience too. And even things like age-related dementia. One of dog owners' worst fears is rage syndrome. Rage syndrome is a psychotic disorder in dogs in which they experience uncontrollable bouts of rage. It was previously believed to be a behavioral issue, perhaps something to do with trauma. More recently, it's been discovered that brain damage can induce rage syndrome. This is an extraordinarily difficult thing to deal with because your dog may be your dog 90% of the time, but every once in a while they go through uncontrollable bouts of rage and they can really harm people, especially children. This would be considered psychotic, just like animals who might chew on a door until they've damaged their teeth or face. My cat tends to overgroom out of anxiety until she's pulled hair out of her body and eventually she can get infections. These can be controlled to some degree, as long as you identify them and identify that mental illness occurs in animals too. One of the things that scientists have believed that only humans could experience is schizophrenia. It would be very difficult to demonstrate that an animal is hallucinating. I mean, how often does your cat or dog like to stare into the dark and you're wondering, what is it that they're seeing? Are they communicating with the sleep demons? You will see plenty in the literature that animals don't have the same psychiatric disorders that we have, but you can model it in animals. You can elicit the same brain imbalances that you would see in a person in a mouse. Mice can exhibit many of the same behaviors under the same conditions that humans will. It's just a little bit more difficult to say that they're actually experiencing something like hallucinations. We can't ask them. Destructive behaviors can become quite intense. They can lead to things like amputations or loss of life. Our friends, the mice, have been used to model tons of different diseases, and the reason you can do that is because they're similar enough to us. I mean, technically, you can model rectal cancer in flies, and I know people who do that. But when you're looking for a model, you want it to be similar. You want it to be a mammal. You want it to have many of the same genes that we do. They are super tolerant to inbreeding, which is why we can use them for more controlled experiments. And that's a whole other conversation that I feel passionately about, because if you're using only inbred male mice, you're missing a huge swath of the population. And if you go straight to human studies after you've tested a medication, in mice, you may not know what other kinds of side effects it has. The specific reason they don't like to use female mice is because female mice are prone to getting tumors. If you are doing a medication study and a population ends up with tumors, that could affect whether or not your medication ever comes to market. That also means if your medication actually does give women tumors, you might have freaking missed it. I have many feelings about this. Also, there's a monument to laboratory mice in Siberia, in Russia, because they really have given us an awful lot. They've developed medications, they've helped us understand ourselves. They are the unsung hero of science. 